here we go. So uh, I'm Rajat. I don't have a machine learning background. I'm pretty new to data science. My background is distributed systems. So bear with me. All the hard questions I'm going to punt to someone else. Um, uh, so I work for Dato. Uh, I spent a lot of time prior to Dato with AWS and with Microsoft. Um, uh, I joined Dato as a first employee, so I've been around for, for a while. Um, I spent the first year and a half or so at Dato working on our production tools. Um, I'll show you one of those uh, a little bit. And uh, the last six months I switched over to this product role where I spent a lot of time with customers, uh, helping them integrate our products into their applications. So tonight I want you guys, uh, it's after work, uh, it's late in the evening, I don't want anyone falling asleep, so please interrupt me with questions. Um, I can make my talk go as long or as short as possible. Um, so please, uh, make this fun. Um, me just talking by myself is not gonna be that much fun, except for me. Um, so telling you a little bit about Dato, who are we? Well, we're based out of Seattle. Uh, we are a, uh, I've only got two slides to tell you about Dato, so I'm not gonna tell you that much, but that's roughly all of us. Um, there are about 35 of us now. Um, and uh, it's always nice, I'm in San Francisco, it's always nice when San Francisco weather in July matches Seattle weather in July. It's not that common, but today happens to be one of those days, so I'm quite happy. So what do we do at Dato? Why do we exist? It's kind of a simple thing. We exist because we believe all apps today have to be intelligent. And what do I mean by intelligent? If you go back 10 years, the problems that existed in the world were about getting all your data into one place. So there were a lot of uh, technical solutions to get data into one place. If you think about the last five years, it's been about traditional analytics. And what I mean by traditional analytics are things like a dashboard that says 30% of your users are gonna churn. 30% of your users churn every, after a month of using your product. So you now know that in aggregate, but how do you do something about it? You get into a room as a group of people, look at the dashboard and go, oh crap, 30% of our users churn after 30 days. We should do something about that. What do we do? Well, let's come up with a strategy, let's do something, um, and then you would take action. And that's not an intelligent app. So an intelligent app would do something else. An intelligent app would say, with 30% likelihood, Tony is gonna churn. Oh, he was over there, he's gone now. Um, he's way back there now. Um, he churned, look at that. Um, 30% likelihood Tony's gonna churn this week. But I know I have five offers I could send him, and offer number three has the highest likelihood of retaining him. And so I'm gonna send him that offer. So if you think about the difference, an intelligent app integrates predictions into the user experience of the app. So of course you guys all know this, machine learning is kind of the key to making that happen, and there's tons of applications and use cases for machine learning. So that's why we exist. This is the world that we see today, and this is the world we want to support. So we built a platform, uh, and our platform is, uh, makes it easy to develop, deploy, and manage predictive or intelligent applications. Our goal is that our tools enable you, as data scientists and developers, to build things faster, and helps you create new applications or explore new ideas. So what's our platform look like? It's got three products. We're gonna get through this in 35 seconds. Product number one, GraphLab Create. Hopefully you all have this on your, on your laptops. Uh, you pip install this just like you do any other Python package. And in GraphLab Create, we have uh, scalable data structures, the S-frame and S-graph. These both scale out of core, so you're not limited by system memory. And they're both columnar representations for your data, making them really fast for analytics operations and lots of really fun compression techniques as well. On top of them, we have our machine learning models. I'm gonna kind of walk through uh, deep learning a bit today, um, though not technically, I'm just gonna kind of tell you about it. Um, and our models are, again, they scale because they're built on these data structures at scale, and we offer an SDK um, uh, to extend our platform. To go to production, we have two products. I'm not gonna go into them in, in great depth, but uh, predictive services uh, allows you to take your model and put a service-oriented architecture in front of it, um, giving you all the tools to manage and operate that, uh, that cluster. And Dato Distributed is about taking what you've done on one machine using GraphLab Create, and running it on a cluster of machines, whether that's on-premise or in the cloud. So that's it on, uh, about Dato. Uh, obviously, I'd love to, I can answer lots more questions about the company, but I thought we'd talk about images instead. Um, so I wanna get really quickly to writing code, because I'm, I'm hoping that's what you guys wanna see. But before I do that, I do wanna motivate um, with one quick demo. Um, 
And hopefully QuickTime is going to cooperate. So how many of you have seen this demo before? One, one person. Yeah. Um, don't give it away. So, uh, so what are we doing? So uh, what you're looking at here is a, a really quick uh, demo application that was written uh, using Data Predictive Services, GraphLab Create, and specifically our, our deep learning model. Our, and so we, we implemented, and correct me when I get this all wrong, but we implemented AlexNet, the, 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 the Jeff Hinton um, ImageNet, uh, the, the ImageNet model, the convolutional neural net ImageNet model. And it took us a little while. Um, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, deep learning is a, is a tough thing to get into and it's a tough thing to, to master. So even when you took an existing paper, um, it still takes, uh, took us a few weeks to, to get the model trained in the same way to give us those same results. We then took that trained model and deployed it as a predictive service to a three node cluster in AWS. That's the cluster that is, uh, is running. And then uh, we put this front-end app on top of it that's just a, basically JavaScript and HTML that's hosted on Heroku. So the idea is when you click on a picture, in this case I clicked on uh, this dog, we sent that picture off to the predictive service to get back the predicted labels. Not sure if you're familiar with the, the task of the, the ImageNet data set. It's a million uh, images and a thousand labels. And so the idea is uh, can we predict the labels? So do you guys know what type of dog this is? And from our training set, this is a German Shepherd. And what you see here is the, the label along with the confidence of that label. So let's try another example. And so uh, what type of dog is this? Do you guys know? I didn't know until I ran this demo. It's uh, Bouvier de Flandre. My French is pretty lousy. My high school French teacher would be upset. Um, and, uh, and on we go. So what are we doing? We're, we're labeling or we're classifying images. We're giving them a label, a predicted label. So I don't know, what do you guys think this is? So, many, so much whispering, so little saying it out loud. All right, we're just gonna say mask in our training set, okay. So these sorts of demos can be pretty canned. So let's search for something instead on Getty Images. So what do you guys wanna search for? <laughs> Picture, I, I, there's no um, people in, this, in the ImageNet data set, so it won't identify people. But let's see if I can search for fast car, and I have to apologize, this demo often, well, Getty Image cooperated tonight, great. So uh, which one of these do we want to try? Let's try this one. So I click on the image, we sent it off, and we got back our predicted labels. Sports car, that's not so bad. You want to try something else, guys? What do you think? What's that? Cat? Like, like that? I'm very curious what Getty Images has for cats. I've not actually tried that. <clears throat> oh, see, I, I spoke too soon. Getty Images was awesome for fast car, but apparently hates me now. For fast cat. <laughs> yeah, really. That's <laughs> so when all else fails, we're going to restart the demo. We're going to try again. There we go. Now we got some cats. Uh, which one do you guys want? How about this one in a box? Let's see what it figures out here. <laughs> With the Getty Images thing right over the face of the cat. Beagle. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good, but low, notice how low the confidence is. It's not... Which one? The one in the tie? Oh, oh my. This could be, uh, this could be horrible. This could be horrible. Egyptian cat. All right. Okay. That's, that's not so bad. All right. So we're doing image class... Um, did we get a tie in there? Bow tie. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, you guys! Oh no, where'd it go? Come back. All right. Well, clearly, we could do this for like. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> oh. Well, I think I'm done here. Um, I can't top that for the, for the rest of the night. Um, so I wanted to, so let me go back to my slides, but I wanted to show you, um, this is kind of uh, what you see all the time with deep learning. You, you take some images. Um, whoa, what happened here? Whoa. 
Wow, that didn't show up right. Let's try that again. Uh, wow. Not that this slide's that awesome, so if it doesn't work, we'll just move right along. Ah, better. So obviously, there's lots of work that's been done in text. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Alexi mentioned some of it that you can start to do with images. And I wanted to show you a little bit about that tonight. Um, essentially, an afternoon that I was hacking around. Um, and I want to show you sort of the outcome of that. So these are some great use cases. So what did we just do? What's the demo I just showed you? This is, uh, if, you, if you like uh, you know, million foot views of things, uh, you take an image of a cat. You put it into this magic black box, and you get back a label that says cat. So if that's machine learning, what's the workflow look like? This is all completely uh, remedial. You guys know this, but I'm going to go through it really fast. So for supervised learning, start with label data, split it. Uh, you, uh, you create a model. You run the model against the validation set. It's probably not good enough. Go back and adjust hyperparameters, and off you go. So I jumped to my demo early, but that's fine. So this is what we just did, right? You saw this whole process happening where we took the, or sorry, you didn't see this happening because the model was already trained, but you then saw what, uh, how you would use that sort of application to make predictions for images. So, so this is as far as I'm going to go into deep learning. Um, this is a picture of the ImageNet uh, paper of the model of the layers of the convolutional neural net. Um, and that's as much as I know about deep learning. And so I apologize if you guys came expecting a lot of, uh, of insight on how the model works. I can tell you, I, I know there's terms like dropout layer and pooling layer. And, um, and I, at one point, I, th I think I even understood part of that, but I've long since forgotten it. Um, I, wanna do, uh, I wanted to, do, to try something that would be a lot more fun. So I wanted to push the easy button and not have to learn uh, about deep learning at all. I want to take an existing deep learning model that's already been trained and extract features from it, much like you would extract features from other models, and then apply them into a different domain. Sometimes this is called transfer learning. So that's what I'm doing. That's what the rest of tonight's about. If that's not what you came here for, I'm sorry. Maybe you can take a sticker. Um, so transfer learning. Uh, I already talked about this. If you train a model, use it for one thing, and then you want to apply it to another task. That's exactly what we're going to do with, uh, with this existing trained deep learning model. So how does this work back on our workflow, our supervised machine learning workflow? Well, you start with label data again. This time, you're going to extract features from your neural net. This is going to give each, uh, each image in your neural net is going to represent it in a reduced dimensionality space as a vector of floats. We're then going to use those floats. We're going to split them into a train and test set. Because now we have this vector representation for each image. We're going to train a simpler model. Let's say a, uh, well, we'll use a nearest neighbors model. But you could create a classifier again in a different context or something else. And now you can validate. And this probably works. And I'm going to show you it's. Um, kind of disturbing how well this works. So you deploy it, and off you go to dollar signs. So I, I promised potentially profit in the title, so there it is. Um, of course. I mean, it's in a slide. How could, it, how could I be faking that? Um, so how does feature extraction work? This slide looked awesome, so I took it from uh, my colleague Sean. Um, I think the main takeaway for me from this slide is that you extract features at the layer prior to, it, to uh, labeling. So if you think about a neural net as a set of layers, um, there's at the, I guess at the, at the bottom or at the top, I'm not sure how you want to orient it, um, there's the step of actually saying, OK, this, uh, um, this, if you fall into this bucket, you are a cat. So we want to, to extract features prior to that, because we don't care about the labeling of cats. We want to just learn what the model learned, or we want to be able to extract what the model learned prior to that labeling, that final step for labeling. Does this make sense? OK. So that's it. The rest is going to be about code. And so we're going to go from cats to houses. Because uh, on a Friday afternoon at work, I wanted to see, could I do this for um, house pictures? So that's what I did. 
We're going to switch over to IPython Notebook. I hope you guys are okay with that. Um, and this is all code, so I'm going to zoom in a little. Can you guys, no? How about this? Can you read this? Yes? No? Should I go further? This is fine? It's good. I got a thumbs up way in the back. Two. All right. So I got to tell you what I did. Um, and, I, and I don't think I violated um, Redfin's terms of service. But uh, I'm going to tell you what I did. Um, hopefully they don't mind too much. So they don't want you to scrape the site, but I wanted to get house pictures. So I didn't scrape the site. Um, I did exactly this. I was like, well, let me look at houses in Seattle. And I, I'm sorry, guys, that these prices don't all start with a million dollars. I know it'll be unfamiliar to you guys down here that there's actually housing you can buy that's less than a million bucks. Um, uh, but hopefully you'll bear with me. It does exist. You just have to come to Seattle. Um, so uh, say I pick this neighborhood in Seattle that has 290 listings, which is exactly what I, what I did. Um, scroll down on this, this UI and you can download all of the listings. And, these, um, and what you get is a CSV file um, that uh, I then used. And so I didn't scrape the site, but let me show you the other half of what I did. So I downloaded these listings, and I did this for a few neighborhoods in and around Seattle, and I'll show you how many I ended up with. Um, but if you click on a, a property, uh, a listing, you'll see that we've got uh, an image here. So let's make this image big, and then let's go and, and find the image URL. Um, so we'll open this in a new tab. Um, maybe you guys can't quite see that. Um, yeah, you can't see that. Uh, ba, 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 ba. I'll do this. I will paste this back over here. Oh, okay. Can you guys, you guys can see this though, right? Um, I noticed this kind of interesting thing. So I'm now connected to the CDN directly. This is a photo. It says big photo. I noticed these three numbers line up with these three numbers. And these six numbers are the MLS listing. So the ID for the, the overall house listing. So I was like, well, this can't possibly be true. Obviously, they must use something more sophisticated than this in order to keep me from getting all their images. And um, they do something slightly more tricky. This underscore zero, um, I believe, represents like if the real estate agent uploads pictures multiple times, these rev. So these become one, two, three. But for my purpose, I was OK with just getting the original set of pictures that were uploaded. So I went with this as a presumption. And I went and so I took all my downloaded CSVs. Um, and I'm in GraphLab Create, by the way, here. Um, so from here on in, I'm in GraphLab Create, which is a Python API over our C++ engine. Um, and I went to load, I, I downloaded a, a bunch of CSV files, and I went to load them all. And you can see I did this back on June 5th at 9 p.m., 8 p.m., 9, 9 p.m. Um, I think that might have been UTC. I don't know. I don't know what time zone that was. Um, so off I went, and I downloaded, I took those CSVs, and I ingested them. And GraphLab Create uh, took a look at what I got. And S-Frame is our tabular data structure. So it went and parsed the CSV, and this is what it came up with. There's lots of info in here. Um, but before I show you the column names, let's just look up the number of rows I got, which should be the number of. Uh, um, so 5,660. Um, I can look at the top, uh, do a dot head on it, and see what I get. Basically, sale type, home type, address, city, state, zip, list price. Look at that, guys. Less than a million. Less than a million. 2.9 million. More than a million. Um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, bedrooms, bath, location, uh, square footage, lot size, year built, parking. Is it on the market? Days on the market? A bunch of other interesting things I didn't care about. Uh, original list price. And the big magic listing ID, which is that MLS number I was talking about, which uh, let me go and get some images for each listing. So um, I did that. Before I did that, because I, I was doing a bunch of searching between uh, um, different neighborhoods in Seattle, I'm sure that I got duplicates. So I wanted to collapse my duplicates. So I did a couple, a group buy and a join. So I'm at 5,660. Um, and then I wrote some pretty heinous Python code 
um, mostly because I was writing it, uh, to download these images. So taking, uh, um, so given a URL, go and download that picture if it doesn't already exist on the file system. Um, so I could cache these. And then I wrote this little helper function that would go and reconstruct the, uh, the big uh, CDN URL. Though I noticed it's different today. You guys noticed it was HTTPS something or other, and this says HTTP media dot. Maybe they changed something, who knows. Um, so, uh, and then I went off and downloaded. And so I wanted to verify that for a particular MLS listing, I would go and get all of the pictures for that listing. So download images returns the number I downloaded. So 24 pictures, or this might be the ID. I think this is the ID. Um, and so I don't know if you guys are familiar with Redfin, but you can upload 25 pictures um, for each house. So far, so good, yeah? We're, scra we're getting some data. This was the, the goal of the first hour or two hours of my activity. Um, I wanted to, uh, now to actually run these functions I just wrote, it's a simple apply function. Um, so it's an arbitrary lambda or anonymous function in Python that I'm applying to a column of the S frame. And since the S frame is immutable, um, I'm assigning my result back to a new column that's created. So off this went, I downloaded uh, 67,758 um, images. So not too shabby for you know, a couple hours worth of uh, work on my, this laptop, this one you're looking at. Um, and I was running out of disk space, so at the same time I realized I have to go and clean up some stuff. Um, I had to ditch my music collection and all sorts of other stuff that was sitting on my machine. Um, so, so far we've, uh, we've downloaded um, images and we have listings. And so that's sort of the, the raw data. So the first step of trying to find similar house pictures is just getting some pictures. So we did that. Um, so now we're off to, uh, to actually using them. So you guys can still read this, right? Yeah? I'm not gonna run everything that I did, mostly because uh, some of the steps do take a long time on a laptop. They'd be super fast on a machine with a GPU. Um, but my laptop doesn't have one, so uh, I'm processing images like three images a second. A uh, system with a GPU can do 200. Uh, even a, an older model NVIDIA CUDA um, GPU card can do 200, 220 images a second. So, um, so uh, IPython notebook again. I'm going to import GraphLab, and I'm going to tell GraphLab that, hey, when you're visualizing stuff, just do it in line in my IPython notebook. So the first thing I got to do um, is uh, I want to call, I want to load all those images that I downloaded. So if you guys were paying really close attention in the previous notebook, I downloaded everything to a cache or to a directory on my file system um, called images. We can go take a look at it if you'd like. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Doo -doo. It's a little big, so it might take a little while. But there you go. So you can see these are all the, this is the MLS listing and the number of the image and the version, and I always got version zero. So those are all my images, and so I've got a, oops, um, I need to load them, and I'm loading them into GraphLab Create. I want to create an S frame out of these images. So GraphLab Create supports uh, text, numbers, uh, complex uh, document structures like JSON and XML as column types, along with images. And so uh, I can, so I'm loading in images. I'm saying that I, you know, figure out the format. Uh, it's a JPEG or PNG, you guys, the, the system can figure that out and recurse the, the directory structure. So if I had lots of subdirectories inside that, I wouldn't have to run this more than once. Then this table that got created, I want to add a row number to it so that I have, a, so I have an ID for that, for that image. Now the ImageNet model, uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, it worked on images. The ImageNet data set is 256, 256 by 256 by three, meaning 256 by 256. Uh, each image has dimensions 256 by 256, and then three colors, um, so RGB values. So, um, so we need to do the same. One of the, the things about neural net models is you must, your model, uh, if you want to use that model, it, you have to make your images be exactly the same. The, the same dimensions, have the, the same uh, 
have the same number of dimensions. So uh, I'm using this resize functionality. This is one of the things that is quite slow unless you have a GPU. Um, so I'm resizing all of the images I had and I'm assigning them and, and I'm creating a new column for the resized image. And then I'm renaming uh, the, the columns because I, I don't want it to be called resize, I want it to be called image and I want the original one that was called image to be called orig. Um, and then uh, I want to go and get the MLS listing out of the file name. So I'm essentially again applying a lambda with a Python path base name to go pull the first half of the file name out because I'm going to use this later. And then I want to save this S frame. So everything I'm doing, uh, I want to save it back to disk. The main reason, I, go ahead. Yeah. I certainly can. Um, so the question was, are S frames local or can they be distributed? And the answer is, uh, the best way to describe S frames is they, uh, they start local and they can grow to distributed. And you'll hear a lot more about that if you come to our conference on Monday. Um, and so, uh, but yes, the, the, the way to think of this is the, this is an out of core uh, data frame. So uh, it's writing to your local disk. Um, now your local disk could be HDFS, it could be S3. So you can choose where you'd like uh, S frames to write things out, but it itself is not a distributed file system. So if you have HDFS um, or another distributed file system, then you can save using that. Where uh, um, you can also, we support, uh, um, you can stripe your, so S frames are columnar, so each column is written to a separate file like most data warehouses, like most columnar storage systems. And as such, when, uh, you can specify uh, a series of file paths where you'd like your S frames to be stored and this way you can get striping across multiple disks or um, helping you get to, to, if you have distributed file systems, you can leverage that. So far so good? Yeah? Any other questions? No? Okay. So I saved this S frame and now uh, I didn't really want to make you guys wait for all that to happen so I'm just going to load the one I had already saved. And so I did. Um, I'll do it again just so you guys can see that. It's instantaneous because again, it's already saved on disk. We're just loading the indices effectively. Um, so you can see I have 41,531 images in my S frame. And when you look at the, the head or the top 10 rows, um, you see I've got the path of the file, the original image dimensions, the resized image dimensions, and I've already extracted the features because that takes uh, a long time as well. Um, but that's the next thing I, I need to do. Um, so the very next thing I need to do is uh, go and grab that deep learning model so that I can take the, the trained model and extract, essentially um, tell that model to extract features from images that uh, it, has, it has not seen. So instead of asking it to predict, I'm asking it to extract features from these images. So you can download this model. We've, we've made our, our ImageNet model that ran for 45 iterations available. Um, and so you can go and grab it. Uh, so I already did and it takes a little while to load because it's a pretty big model. But once it's downloaded, you can load it really quickly. So I've loaded it. Let's take a look at it. You can see, like I said, 1 million images, 1.28 million images. Um, I'm not really, I don't care about my target column because I'm not using the model to classify. I'm just using the model, uh, think of it as a feature pipeline. So I'm essentially wanting to run through the feature pipeline and take the, the output of that pipeline prior to labeling. So now I did that. Um, so now I have the model. So let me explain why you'd want to extract features. So if you look at even a 256 uh, pixel, like just 256 by 256 image, times three, you have about 200,000 dimensions. So that's a lot of numbers to represent a small picture. But when I extract features from my neural net, I take that same image and now I'm able to get a fingerprint for it that's only 4,096 or 4K um, dimensions. So this is a much more manageable number. So again, you get dimensionality reduction when you, when you uh, extract features. So how do you do that? It's as simple as, pre-trained model or whatever the model we just loaded, dot extract features, pass in the column that has the features, uh, that has the images you'd like to extract features from. This will return you an S array, which I'm then assigning to a new column of my S frame. And then I save it again. 
So I want to show you what that looks like. This took a while. Um, I think on my machine this took a while, uh, a few hours. I don't think I, I think I, I, I was, um, I think this took about two, two and a half hours. Um, so uh, be prepared for that. Uh, and what you see uh, is now I, if I look at one of my images, so I'm looking at the first image and I'm looking at the features column, I now have a vector or an array of floats that represent this image. It's not interpretable at all, but um, it is a lot simpler to, uh, um, it is a lot smaller in terms of data than the image itself. So I've got this, so now I've extracted features. Um, so now I have this numeric vector of numbers that represent each image. So I'm going to throw that into a nearest neighbors model so that I can, and nearest neighbors is going to compute distances between these vectors. And, that, and by, with, that, uh, with that representation, the model will then help me query for the nearest images or nearest items uh, from uh, any given item. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So we're going to do that. We're going to run this one. Go ahead. Yeah, it's going to tell us. It's Euclidean. Um, and it's, um, and we're using brute force. Um, so this is all just out of the box. Like I can, I can change my distance function if I'd like. Um, and I can use ball tree instead of brute force. Um, and when I poked around with that, it didn't make anything any better that I could tell. Um, so um, it could be because I only have 41,000 examples. Um, that, you know, it's not, um, but uh, so here we go, 10 seconds, I've trained my, my neural net now um, with uh, brute, brute force. A lot of the heavy lifting happens at the time you query, not at the time you're training the model. This is essentially just putting all pairs together. You still have to iterate through them to find nearest neighbors. So let's find nearest neighbors. So first things first, let's, uh, let's bring up a sample image. So what I did here is, remember I had the images table, the images S frame. So I want to get one row out of that. And so I'm using Python slicing, so 250 is inclusive. Uh, um, I want essentially the 250th row. And Why do you use slicing? I don't actually. Couldn't I just do this? It's totally fair. Let's, let's. You also didn't need those lambda functions. Oh, tell me more about why I didn't need the lambda functions. Because it's just, if you only have one parameter you're passing, it's just assumed you Oh, yeah, well done, guys. I totally hadn't thought of that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what happens if I do this? I think I get back a dictionary, which, um, which is fine. But if I do that, do I get the same thing back? I do not. Um, it's not a list, yes. The, the, so I'm getting back. Uh, this, I think, is a dictionary for one row. Um, and this is a Python dictionary. Yep, this is a dictionary. Um, but when I go for slicing, I, I get back an S frame. That's why. Because um, I wanted it, I want an S frame. So, go ahead. It's a good question. So the question was, uh, how are features selected out of the image? Um, and I don't have, uh, the, the way I'll describe it is um, all pixels are uh, interpreted and what the model, what the ImageNet model, um, um, the ImageNet model uh, does a good job of identifying um, colors, shapes, and textures within those images. So that's actually one of the things that's really amazing about the ImageNet model is that it generalizes incredibly well. So it was trained on uh, very natural images. The, the million images are very natural um, setting images. It's not to say that it can work everywhere, um, but I'm pretty surprised uh, the number of applications that how, ge how generalizable that model is. So in, uh, com like I'm looking at house pictures, there is, I doubt, a house picture in the ImageNet data set. Um, and yet, you'll see how we do. Does that answer your question? 
Any other questions? Uh, this one here that I'm showing, this, this row, this is an S frame, uh, uh, the, the Graph Lab Create S frame or the Dato S frame. Oh, yeah. So the idea, this is why I'm slicing, because I, I want to get back, though I only care about one row, I want it to come back as an S frame. Um, go ahead. Nope, we haven't touched the ImageNet model other than to use it to take each of our images. It's a great question. So the question was, um, are you, uh, did the nearest neighbors thing influence or manipulate the ImageNet model? The answer is the ImageNet model, we sort of aren't using it as a model. We're not asking it to predict. We're, act we're just telling it to, to, to use it as a data engineering pipeline. So given a raw image, uh, chew up that image and spit out a vector of floats that represent that image, given what the model has learned um, what the model has learned uh, in part. So we're never actually asking the model to predict. We're only using it to try and um, absorb what it's interpreted from, uh, um, from its training. So this is why it's the easy button, guys. It's, uh, you know, we're basically, we don't have to know anything about deep learning, um, and we can start to make something kind of, kind of neat. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm getting that one row, and then I'm going to show you, dot show the original image. So now I'm showing the one, the, so this is a picture I randomly picked out of that data set. I was like, oh, this looks interesting. It's a kitchen. Um, let's see what's most similar from our data set to a picture of something that, uh, I think this is, a, I mean, this is a kitchen, right? You guys agree with me? Like, um, there's nothing in the data set that indicates it's a kitchen other than it's just an image. And when we look at it, it looks like a kitchen. So we're going to go and ask our nearest neighbor's model. We're going, so this was the nearest neighbor's model we trained. Now we're asking it at, to predict. So we're saying query this image and get me the 10 nearest neighbors to it and tell me what you're doing as you're doing it. So off we go. This is, by the way, all this is running on my laptop. I should have made that really clear up front. Um, so everything I'm doing here is on my laptop and when I'm doing something not on my laptop, I will let you know. Um, and this is, by the way, no fancy laptop at all. This is like an 8 gig MacBook Pro of very average proportions. Um, so eight seconds, um, and we've gotten our 10 nearest uh, items. So you can see for the query label, which is labeled 0, these are the reference labels. So these are the row numbers of the images that are close. So obviously, it returns itself because that has distance 0. And then you can see everything else that's pretty close starts at 41 and moves its way up to 43. So do you guys want to see, uh, see what we got? So before I show them to you, just remind you, this is what we started with. What are the 10 nearest things to that? So that's what we started with, this one. The mo what we got back is the 10 nearest pictures look like this. I'll just scroll through them again so you guys, I can't get them to show up uh, all together. So I have to scroll slowly. Um, so those the same as those both above? They are, yeah. They should be, yeah. So the, the furthest in your set is the same kitchen but from a different view? It looks like it. Yep. It looks like the same kitchen, but it, maybe it's not. I mean, I don't know. All these high-end kitchens look the same to me. I, I don't know how else to describe it. They all have the, these high ceilings and the, 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 the lighting that drops and the granite countertop. and the. Yeah, it does have identical light fixtures. Now, one thought is maybe that's the same neighborhood. I didn't, I didn't go investigate. I could actually. Um, are these, what's that? <laughs> it depends what neighborhood you're in. You could definitely get this uh, if, you, if you step away from Seattle and go 20 miles east um, for less than a million. Uh, so this was kind of exciting to me. I don't, I don't know if you guys uh, find this exciting, but um, I know you guys know as much as I You guys now have heard everything that I know about deep learning, which is very little. Um, and uh, yet I'm able to take advantage of a, a trained deep learning model and actually do something that looks kind of interesting. So this, this was really exciting for me. And my, my immediate reaction after I saw this was, 
I got really lucky. There's no way. I just got lucky with this picture of kitchens that returned kitchens. Like this was a, um, this was a fluke. So um, like any dev I think would, I was like, all right, I'm going to go get similar images for every, one, every 25th image out of the 41,000. And I'm going to store them as a dictionary in Python. And then I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and then I'm going to go and look through some of those to see if I have any, was this a fluke or did this really happen? It was also pretty late at night by the time I got to this point. So I was like, I'm just going to leave this running, go to bed next morning, see, see what I got. Um, so what I did is I wrote my little tiny for loop, which correct me if my Python code looks awful, um, it could, um, where I'm given, given an x, I'm going to get that row as an s-frame. Going to query, I only asked for the five most similar images from this uh, um, to run this faster. I don't care about the seeing what it does anymore. And then what actually is a pretty expensive step is this join um, because of the image type um, and the way the nearest, neighbors, the nearest neighbors model is just returning the IDs. So I need to now join those, the, that table that I got back with my images table and then pull out the, uh, the 10 most simple. So that's, that's what my join is doing. Um, and then I'm sorting it by distance so that I'm going to have those in a, um, uh, in a uh, in sorted order. And then I'm assigning this to a dictionary. And then, that, then I uh, essentially can go through and show that dictionary. This was what, um, so this is what I ran. I'm not going to show you all this. Um, because it's, as you can tell, kind of meaningless. But the important thing I got out of it uh, the next morning is I went and started poking through these numbers and started writing down, you know, labeling some of these to see if they were any good. And some of them actually turned out to be pretty neat. So then I was like, OK, well, that was fun. Um, now I've got something that seems kind of interesting. So the next thing I wanted to do was um, I was sick of waiting for that join. That join was taking like a second for each, um, each image uh, on my, on my laptop. So I thought, all right, I'm going to, let's just put this up as a service. I actually don't need to do the join because I can reconstruct the URLs because I already know all I need is that MLS listing number and the image number and I can just go and pull the URLs directly. Um, and so why don't I do that? And so I wrote a little function to help me do it. Um, and this is where I'm using uh, data predictive services. I'm taking my trained model, wrapping it in Python code and then deploying that as a service. So now I can just query the service um, with a, uh, an MLS listing and an image and get back the 10 most similar images. Um, so I wrote a little lookup function that just uh, was a smaller S frame with just the ID and MLS number because I need this to construct the URL. Um, and then I wrote this little Python function that became, this is my service function. So think of this as my service endpoint. So, uh, Again, the idea is I'm taking an, uh, a listing number and a URL, and I'm going to get the 10 closest, 10 nearest images, or 10 most similar images, and return them, uh, and return the URLs for them, so that the client could then, uh, can then go and fetch those URLs directly and, and render them. So I'm doing all the same stuff I did before. I need to download the image so that I can then resize the image and then extract features on that image. Then I'm going to query the nearest neighbor's model, this time I made k equal to 11 because I don't want to return the image that was the input. I want to get the 10 closest, not the 9 closest and the original. Um, and then uh, I'm going to reconstruct these URLs. Um, doing some string manipulation in, my, uh, uh, in Python and referencing this S frame to look up the reference label because I again need to get back to the ID. It's kind of a detail there. Um, and I'm going to return this as a JSON block, um, where I'm returning a dictionary, uh, so that, or a Python dictionary that gets converted back to JSON. And each entry in that dictionary shows me the rank of the image um, and the URL for it. So that's my service. Um, and let's run it for a, uh, a random listing and image. Uh-oh. Oh, right. IPython doesn't know about my, my function yet. Let's try it again. So I'm just calling this function locally, just so that I'm testing it. This is you know, what, you, what everyone would do. So here we go. My function ran, and I got back um, rank 1, 2, 3, 4. It turns out this was a horrible format. I did a terrible job of making this API easy to inter interact with, but um, so be it. <laughs> and I got back URLs. Um, so, now let's, uh, so now I wanted to take this function and deploy it as a service. So this is data predictive services. 
Um, I've got some boilerplate stuff on how you get started here, but you set some AWS credentials because we're launching an EC2. You say what region you want to go to, um, where you want your log files to get written, the instances, the instance type you want to run, and the number of them you want to have in your cluster. Um, and then it's one command to kind of launch the cluster. Uh, this one I named Yelp Funny, um, which I was using for a, a different demo. Uh, um, and so this is how you would launch your own predictive service. I, I don't want to wait for AWS. That takes a while um, to spin up you know, three, four instances. could take 10 minutes. I don't want to make you guys wait. So we'll just load an existing predictive service. And that's as easy as passing in the, the place, the, the S3 location where the uh, the, the state path, where all the state for the predictive service is there. And I can add, um, to add the endpoint, I just, uh, I just give it, or to add this function, the, the get similar images function, which we defined up here, and make this a service, it's as easy as uh, deployment.add, give it a name, and then the function. And the name here represents your uh, the REST endpoint. So this becomes part of the REST, uh, this, this is the part of the REST API for this model or for this service. So it's as easy as that. Um, we call apply changes. I'm not running these two uh, real time because this model is a little big and so it's, uh, it takes about 10 minutes or so to upload. But this is the first time something's going off of my machine. So I told you guys I'd let you know when something happens off my machine. So when I call apply changes, that's when we're actually taking uh, that function along with all of its uh, dependencies or all the things that it encapsulates and we're uh, packaging them all up uh, using a super awesome version of Pickle that we extended um, and then pushing them off to S3 and then notifying the nodes in the cluster that, uh, and in, at this point there was only one node in the cluster though I think I've added a couple more. Um, the, uh, uh, that there, there's a new model or there's a new, uh, uh, new service to load and, that's, and so the service can get loaded. So now let's query so that you guys can see what this looks like. So again, I picked a ran uh, an MLS listing out of random and then I picked a random image. So now I'm making a REST API call. I'm using the Python client that's baked into GraphLab Create, but you could use, uh, we have a Python client, Java client, JavaScript client. You could write your own in curl. It's a really, really simple REST API. So all I'm doing is making this REST API call and getting results. So you can see I, I, uh, when I do this, I'm connected to the load balancer that's sitting in front of a predictive service, and then I connect it to one of the machines. Well, since, since you guys are all here, I might as well, let's look at what my predictive service has. Um, so I'm just looking at my predictive service. It's got a, an API key. This is, uh, this is if you want to make query requests, you need this. Um, and then these are all of the uh, uh, services that are deployed along with what version the service is at. Um, so how am I doing on time? How tired are you guys? Um, we're okay? Okay. Um, because really we're at the point where I'm just going to show you a bunch of awesome examples. And so uh, that, that's where we're at. Um, and so, uh, and we could try and find some more house pictures. I was looking for like mansion pictures the, uh, last night. Um, so maybe we can try and find some of those. So I, I saw, so here's my output um, that is now running as a service. So if I query again, I get results instantaneously. Predictive services come with a built-in distributed cache. So queries that you see multiple times are cached. The results are cached. But this is not really fun to look at. This doesn't demo well at all. Um, so let's write a little function to help us uh, actually view the images. And this is how you know you had a bad output format. When this is the amount of work you have to do to get to something that you can see. So I'm unpacking and I don't really want to go through this other than write a better service function that doesn't return things so cryptically and you don't have to go through the, the shenanigans of trying to uh, um, make it so you can see something. But now that I have uh, this show results function, I can pass it a set of results. And we should be able to see, um, so these are the, the images. So now I've kind of got all the machinery I need, right? Now I've got the service deployed, so I don't have to spend the time to do the join to, in order to see what images are most similar. Um, and uh, I've got the functions to help me visualize the results or show the results inside my Python notebook. So my next steps, if I was to keep going with this, um, 
I actually want to, there's more features to add. Like I could, I didn't add any text features yet at all. Uh, certainly I could, especially things like square footage, number of bedrooms, bath, like those are, those aren't really text, those would be categorical. But um, there are definitely text features I could add as well um, that I'd want to play with. There are captions as well. It'd be great to see if I could leverage them. I don't think Redfin makes those available, so I'd have to talk to them probably. Um, but since they're in Seattle, maybe they'd want to talk to me. Um, and so, uh, so, uh, and so there's more that I can do, but this was really fun to just try and get started. So I thought I'd end with um, just some of my results. So some of the, some of the, the fun uh, examples. So I wrote a couple more helper functions here just to make it even easier on me. So I wrote this get args function, and then I wrote this other function. So all I have to do is pass in the index value from my, my list here. Um, so let's start with bathroom. I think bathroom's kind of a fun one. Um, 1,025. Let's do that, 1025. This is kind of what happens when you're trying to build a, a UI inside IPython notebook. Um, but here you go, here's my original image. Um, so this is my picture of a bathroom. Um, so what are the, the most similar images to this? Um, aha, so, I, so just to go through this, I set the IDX, um, the index, and the index uh, this IDX value gets passed into get args, which returns me uh, a dictionary, which has now taken the ID from the ID value, it's gone and gotten the MLS value, and then it's gotten the last three digits of the MLS and pulled off, uh, um, reconstructed the URL from where that image came from. So I'm doing gymnastics to go backwards from where I started so that I can now pass this to the function, to the service. Because that's the, the rest endpoint makes a lot more sense to be given an MLS listing and a URL than to be given anything that references the training set. So just this way, I can apply it to uh, to images that have the service can be uh, for images that the training that the training set never saw. So I need to, in order to to use it for this example, I need to kind of unwind what I've done, and then I go and call the the API. Um, the service, I get back my results, that ugly JSON, um, uh, and then I, uh, I call dot .show on the original image um, for that. So because I'm showing you the original, so results is just that JSON block that's really ugly. I'm going to show you that next, but first I want to show you the original image. So here's where we started. Now I'm going to call, uh, I'm gonna call that little show results function that I wrote um, to go and download those, the, the the images from the JSON block I got back from the service and render them. So for this image, my 10 most similar images, um, or yeah, 10 most. So again, there's nothing in my model, nothing in my system that says that this is an, a bathroom. So let's see what I got. I got bathrooms. And they're pretty varied. They're not, uh, this is what was interesting to me. Lighting is very different. They don't all look the same. They look pretty different. Um, they're weird angles, you know, house pictures, if you've looked at them, a lot of the wide angle lenses are used. Um, some don't, some do, different. So that was interesting, so that was one example. Um, let's try another one. This, let's try, uh, let's do this, outside house, 1450. Uh, let's do that one and show this. So the original. I'm going to show you three more, and then I'm going to give you the plug for the conference, and then be here for any questions. So this is the original. Um, so it looks like an outside picture of a pretty nice house. Um, by the way, I don't know if this is true in San Francisco, but in uh, the Northwest, uh, <laughs> um, you'll find this equal amount of Photoshopping done on all real estate pictures. So the sky is always blue, like this amazing blue. Um, everything's really lush and green. Um, and now it is green, but it's never that bright green that you can only get from Photoshop. And so here you can tell. Um, and so again, nothing about the image, there's, I've, you know, I'm labeling it saying it's an outside house picture thing, but this is what the model, um, this, these are the 10 most similar images. And you can immediately tell how these are all doctored. I mean, the sky rarely looks like that. Um, so let me do three more examples and then, uh, uh, and then I'll switch back to my slides. Um, 2250. What, what was my notes here? Good 3D renderings of modern house exteriors. So, here we go. 
It's a 3D rendering of a new construction. I guess this must be the name of the style of house. And then my 10 most similar. Well, this is another one from that same developer, I'm sure. Um, interesting. Say it again. This one? No. <laughs> no, I don't think it's that photoshopped. I think it's more that the model, uh, I think the, the similarity is in the, the way that these pillars and the shape of the entrance, um, I think that's what's getting picked up is the, this white str the, the white pillars. Um, this one looks pretty lousy, I'll admit. I don't know where this one came from. Um, oh, it could be, yeah. Could be the white sky too, that's a really good point since these are rendered images. Um, so that one I thought was interesting. Let's do another big house. Um, and then I've got one more where we'll do, uh, actually before this, let's do, let's do boats. Boats was fun, I like this one. Um, so apparently, and I didn't know this, um, a lot of people that have, I guess, properties that are on water will include pictures of like the water that they have access to. If your house has its own dock or you, your property has access to a dock, you might include that in your, your, your MLS listing. Well, it turns out that so does everyone else who has that sort of view. So, um, so this was kind of neat that uh, I didn't expect to see this in MLS listings. Clearly, I'm not looking at the right price point to find houses that have their own private dock. Um, but I thought that was cool. Um, uh, let's do uh, 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 let's do this one and that. So here we go. This is a, I mean, this is a rendering. Um, but it looks so close to a photoshopped actual picture too. But you can see this uh, um, modern house, Tudor style, Tudor style, I think is what it's called, with these pillars in front and this patio. Um, what did we get? Um, like, I, I was uh, a little disturbed by how, it, it all makes you a little sad that like all these expensive houses look the same, but, um, <laughs> but there you go, they all kind of do look incredibly similar. Um, and so I'll, I'll end here in terms of uh, um, demos. But uh, again, I just did this. Um, you could see most of this code I wrote was just messy Python to clean up my own bad service. But the actual part of getting my images processed and uh, finding similar images, that was really, really simple. Um, switch back to PowerPoint so I can give you guys a discount code for our conference. So. Our conference is on Monday and Tuesday. Wow, that is getting cut off. That looks awful. We will have a thousand plus data scientists, not data scientists. Um, and uh, we've got some great speakers. If you haven't seen our speaker list, you really should check it out. Um, you're going to get hands on with Dato, with our products. And uh, the, there's a Kaggle competition that you'll get to hear a lot more about. Uh, the website for the conference is conf.dato.com. And uh, it's in San Francisco, by the way. I forgot to mention that. It's, a, it's around the corner in the, the Marriott Marquis. Um, this is the, the discount code. Please don't tweet this. Um, this will get you 50% off the whole shebang. Um, you've got your camera out. I'm so afraid you're going to tweet it. It's totally OK. You, OK. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Relax. <laughs> so uh, Monday and Tuesday is our conference. You're going to get to hear a lot, of, a lot more interesting stuff. Alexi um, got me to talk a little bit about some of the neat stuff you're going to hear about. Uh, there's a lot of other neat things that are coming as well. Um, and I should, I should end with one more thing. Uh, every couple weeks, um, we're down here. We don't have an office in San Francisco, but we try and do office hours. So every other Thursday, we're in San Francisco. Uh, one of our partners is Galvanize, and they've, they've graciously given us space in their, in their building, which is beautiful if you haven't been there before. Um, so you'll see me. You'll see a couple other folks from Dato. We come down every couple weeks, and we're here on Thursdays. The next, uh, the next time we'll be here is next week on Thursday. Go ahead. That's right. The whole thing. Oh, you want me to go back? <laughs> Look at this. 50% <laughs> off the whole thing. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I already think our conference is incredibly, uh, um, I think we're, the, we're, we're uh, pretty cheap to, for 600 bucks to get two days, a full two-day conference, um, especially in San Francisco. Um, but to get that at half off is uh, it's pretty nice. I have to warn you guys, we will sell out if we didn't already. Um, so uh, we, when I left, uh, when I left uh, end of day yesterday, we had over 900 people, and I think we can only fit 1,000 in, uh, in the space. 
um, the fire marshal will be mad if we, if we uh, sell more than 1,000. So that's it, go create something. Hopefully you're gonna do that with Dato. Um, and that's all I've got. Questions? So Go ahead. The model, the model you what did you the model from? What did you do? How did I originally train the ImageNet model? The model you got yeah, I'll tell you how we trained it. Um, the best way I can show you that is by going to our blog. Um, uh, Piotr Tetervak, uh, one of our machine learning engineers, um, is the one that, uh, he wrote this great blog post. So we're going to go to it. Um, so bringing deep learning to the grocery store, that was a fun project that he did. But before that, um, and I'll zoom in here so you can see this a little bit better. Um, I'll do that. Um, he kind of walks through the entire process along with uh, um, uh, sort of walking through how we trained the, the ImageNet data set. We also uh, have, if you haven't uh, been to dato.com yet, we have this uh, learn section that has this gallery of IPython notebooks um, that kind of show end-to-end -end, um, examples of things you can build using our product. And one of those, uh, Jay, uh, Jay Gu, one of our co-founders, uh, worked with Piotr as well. So this is how we train the ImageNet model. So we did this on, uh, uh, on a, a machine that has a GPU and used GraphLab Create for it. And you can see exactly how we did it. Um, it did take a while. Uh, I forget exactly how long. I think the model told us. So if we go back to the model, I think it said something like 29,000 seconds. Oh, it was doing the demo I showed you earlier that with, with, where it's guessing, where it's predicting labels for images. That is the ImageNet model deployed. I should have made that more clear. Other questions? I'm trying to get the answer of how long it took. There we go. 28, no, 288,000 seconds to train. Now we didn't have the most powerful machine to do this on, but, um, uh, and we didn't use the latest <coughs> CUDA, the latest NVIDIA card, but that's, you know, that's why you don't want to have to train your own. You want to make that a last resort. Go ahead. Yes, you can. Yeah, that's what this blog post walks you through. How to train your own, uh, this notebook walks you through. Um, and this blog post walks you through how we trained the ImageNet data set. But what we really trained is a convolution, convolutional neural net using our deep learning toolkit, our deep learning model. You can certainly use AWS. The GPU instances are great. Um, Multi-GPU support, you should come to our conference on Monday. You'll get to hear more about it. Um, uh, AWS now offers multi-GPUs. This idea of doing a distributed system with multiple GPUs, um, it's, uh, I don't think there's a lot of results that point to it improving things. Um, the communication overhead, GPUs are not very good at, you have to do a lot of partitioning ahead of time in order to leverage the, the pipelining in the GPU. So, Trying to have several machines do that partitioning ahead of time and coordinate usually doesn't help you. But multiple GPUs, yes. Go ahead. We, we have our own. Ours is based on uh, CXXNet, um, which uh, this, the story is, uh, um, uh, the primary author of this, CXXNet, Tian Shi, uh, uh, was our intern last summer. Uh, and so this was part of his research. His advisor is our, our uh, CEO, Carlos Gestrin. Um, uh, and so he, uh, this was part of his research. And so we, we took where he was and we built on top of it. So we forked CXXNet and added some stuff to it. But this is, uh, this is our implementation. Um, this is our CUDA library, our implementation of the CUDA library. So I'm, I'm around. I don't want to make you guys all sit here. I'm around. So please come by, say hi, tell me more about what you guys do, and thanks so much for your attention.